because it just comes from the word must. Anology means the doctrine of, and this is the doctrine or the teaching about what Jesus said, I must. He said several times, I must. A few times he referred to himself in the third person, and he spoke about the Son of Man. He must, but he was the Son of Man, so he, I, I developed these, and this is the last of these, just four, four messages on the, the mustology. But Jesus, from childhood to adulthood, knew what he must do. And I don't know, maybe you knew what you must do from childhood. Believe it or not, I knew from about the age of 12, I knew about at that time that God was calling me to ministry, but I did not want to do it. Everybody ever had that attitude? God's calling you to do something and you just didn't want to do what he was calling you to do. But now I would have it no other way because God is so, so good. From childhood, Jesus knew, he said, as a boy, I must be about my father's business. And even as an adult man, he says, the son of man. As a son of man, he is the son of man. That's a messianic term. As the son of man, he said, the son of man must suffer. Must suffer. Uh, I, we try to avoid all pain at all costs, don't we? But he says, I must suffer. This is in the program. This is in the plan of God from before the foundation of the world that he was going to be crucified and that he was going to suffer. He said, I must suffer many things and be rejected. We talked about this last time. Nobody likes rejection. No one. Some young guys won't even ask a gal out because of the major fear that she will say no. And the rejection is so powerful and intimidating, he won't even ask the girl out. Isn't that sad? I figure if you, risk, if you don't risk it, I mean, the worst could be she's going to say no. What if she says yes? <laughs> All right? Rejection, no, it's such a powerful, uh, hurtful, painful thing in your life. And Jesus must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the teachers of the law, and he must be killed killed and on the third day be raised to life jesus knew the plan of the father and he he knew that this was in the plan that the father had for him and he must do it he must do it in another place he says this but first referring to the son of man himself he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation he knew that life was not a cakewalk. If you think that life is easy, if you think being a Christian is easy, you've got another thing coming. It's not necessarily easy. When a person accepts Jesus Christ as their Savior, the first thing he does, he shares it with someone, and they say, what, are you one of those crazy Bible thumpers? And immediately they re get resistance. And when they try to live a testimony, oh, look at Goody Two Shoes, look at Holy Joe, and he gets all the name-calling. And then it becomes a person who's really out to get to Christians who tries to sabotage everything he does. When I worked in the factory, they all knew I was a seminary student, and there were certain individuals that liked to sabotage my work so I would look bad. Why? Just out of meanness? Just, just because I, I was a Christian? Because they wanted to see the reaction of, hey, what is this good guy going to do in a bad cir circumstance? Is? And, and I was suffering in those ways, but there's other ways of suffering. And, and Jesus was, he's, he's going to experience all this. This is what he was called to do. In John 3, 14, the one I will focus on today, he says this, the Son of Man must be lifted up. Now, it was a, a man by the name of Nicodemus that came to Jesus by night. And he says to Jesus, Rabbi, we know you're a teacher come from God. For no one can do the miracles you're doing except God is with him. Jesus responded. He just like, not even to what he just said. He said, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Boom. Uh, Jesus just went right to the chase of the matter. This guy was a, a theologian among the, the Pharisees, uh, and he's a ruler. He's part of the Sanhedrin, the ruling body. And Jesus just goes right for it, and he says, man, you need to be born again. And Nicodemus said, come on, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter into his mother's womb a second time and be born? And Jesus says to him, he says, marvel not. He starts talking mustology here. You must be born again. He says it a second time. You must be born again. 
He says, that which is the flesh is flesh, and that which is of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say to you, you must be born again. Mustology, you must. And so as he's talking, he says, listen, love, the wind blows wherever it wants to. You can hear the sound of it, you feel the power of it, but you do not know where it is going next. And he says, and so it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. And it's at that point that Jesus illustrates mustology for us. He tells this story, he's got this illustration, he says, just as Moses, he says here, what Moses did, just as Moses lifted up the snake, he tells us what he did, Moses lifted up a snake, and he tells us exactly where he did it. He says, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert. But what he doesn't tell us in this passage, Jesus doesn't tell us, is why Moses did this. Why did Moses lift up a snake in the wilderness that Jesus in his story is talking about and is going to relate the story back to himself? Why did Moses lift up that snake in the wilderness, in the desert? For the answer to that, you've got to go to Numbers 21. In Numbers 21, you remember the children of Israel are wandering through the wilderness and uh, they're trying to make their way from Egypt where they were in bondage and slaves and, and they've been freed. They went through the Red Sea and they've been wandering through the wilderness and, and they're, it's time to go into the land, but they want to go through Edom and they want to go through the, this land and they ask for permission. They're not granted per permission, so they got to go around the land. And because they got to go around the land, Moses is going to raise up this, this serpent for what I call respectable sins. You say, what do you mean, respectable sins? Well, those are the kind of sins that we do all the time, and we just say, that's okay, everybody does it. And so we, we say, oh, that's a respectable sin. All right? And, and one here is they were traveling from Mount Hor along the route to the Red Sea to go around Edom. But the people grew impatient. The sin of impatient is a respectable sin. We all get like that, don't we? Here I am, I'm driving a guy in front of me, he's just a little too slow, I honk at him and I move over in a lane, he sends him to move over in the same lane at the same time, I get impatient, I whip over in the other lane, he sends for some reason, realize that, oh, he blocked you, now he's back at it, and you're just furious, you think this guy is out to cause problems for you, and you're so impatient, doesn't he know that you're in a hurry? My youngest son, I mean, we had a microwave, and when he was hungry, it was like all of a sudden he started crying. So you, you know when you put the bottle in the microwave. You just know that two minutes later you're going to get the bottle all heated, right? You think Pavlov's dog would have figured that out? No, he didn't. <laughs> He'd scream all the more until that thing was plopped his mouth because I want it and I want it now. This is a respectable sin. It's okay to be impatient in our culture. No, it's not. Patience. Patience. The people grew impatient on the way, and they spoke against God. The sin of complaining against God. Now, we talked a few months ago about complaining to God, and it's okay to complain to God, but when you complain to others about God, you're complaining against God. Here's how it goes. Why does God bless everybody else and he doesn't bless me? How come I have all the problems of life? Why doesn't God do something for me? My neighbor one time says to me, well, yeah, I've watched. God blesses your life, but God does not bless my life. All right? The sin of complaining, the sin of complaining. Notice it's complaining against God, but he adds this to it. The sin of complaining against God's leaders, his leaders. What was Pastor Henderson thinking? Right? And for some of you, Pastor Dennis. What was he thinking? Did you hear what he said? What is he doing? Moses was not just a spiritual leader like the pastor of this in huge two million congregation. He was their political leader. He was their governing person. 
He got the law from God. He interpreted the law. He sat as a judge over it. Every hard case, he was the Supreme Court. He was it. He was every, never called a king, but he run like a king. He was like the president. You know what I'm saying here is, when you complain about President Donald Trump, that's the sin he's talking about. Do we do that? I think it's done. It was done about Obama before him. It was done about Bush before him. But it should not be so among God's people. They were complaining over Moses' leadership. And this has become a respectable sin for me to run down the president, to run down a politician, to run down people. This has become respectable in our country. But it's not to God. This, this is complaining about the leader he's put in place. You say, yeah, but he's not even a Christian. Does it matter? The book of Isaiah calls Cyrus my servant. Now, Cyrus was a, a pagan king. God said, he's my servant. Calls Nebuchadnezzar my servant. My servant. And these are pagan kings. We are to submit to those who are in authority and we are not to complain against God because of the king or the president or whatever that he's put in position over us. You know what he tells us to do instead? Pray for those who have authority over you. You pray for your president. You pray for your pastor. He said, stop complaining. He said, this is a sin. And it's a, what I call a respectable sin because we think it's okay. It goes a little bit further. They were complaining against God's leading. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in this desert? You know, in this complaining against God, they're saying that God had evil motives. He brought us here to die. It wasn't his plan in order to bless us, to give us a better life, the promised land. He just brought us out here to die. They're complaining against God and the way he is leading I got to admit, life has been difficult a few times. It's not the path that I would have chosen. I wouldn't have chosen the loss to lose a, a, a son at the time of birth. I would, not, I would not have chosen that. And there's a lot of things in life that life can get very difficult, and the, the path that God takes us on can get very trying and hard. But don't complain against God and the path that he's taking you. Watch what he says next. They're complaining against his provisions. There is no bread. There is no water. We detest this miserable food. You know what the food was? Manna. Angel food. I don't know. I don't think it was angel food cake, but you, you can read the description. It was white or flowery, like accordion seed, and it tells us in the Bible all, all it's like. And he says, like a wafer that melted away in the morning and it didn't last long, but you could boil it and you could cook it. It's just all these principles that it's not like anything that we know that we got today. And God provided it every day. And on Saturday, you know, or, the day before the Sabbath would have been Friday, there was a double portion. So on that Sabbath day, you didn't have to collect any. It stayed for one full day so you could have it, and then it disintegrated. God did this miraculous thing providing for them, and they were complaining because you want to know why? It's that same old man every single day. But this is a respectable sin. Oh, do we have to have spaghetti again? Can't you make a little variety in the menu here? I'm up to here with all that. You know, these are little trite things you think about, all the problems in the whole world and all the things that are going on, and they're complaining. And the text says, Moses had to raise up that serpent, that snake, because of God's justice. Well, we consider respectable sins, God's justice has something else in mind. God, it says here, the Lord sent venomous snakes among them and they bit the people. I sometimes wonder if we don't get snake bitten in our own lives. Here I am, I'm complaining about our president and boom, I wonder why things are just not going well in my own life. You think maybe God just snake bit me? 
Hmm. Or I got something to say about the pastor. It's not a compliment. Boom, I get snake bit. You think? Maybe. They were these respectable sins. And they got bit. And many Israelites died. Boy, if we could just control our tongue, control my mouth, sure save me getting into a lot of trouble that I have in my life. If I could just control this little thing, many died. You know, and the New Testament puts it like this, for the wages of sin is death. Doesn't matter if it's a big sin, little sin. A not respectable sin or one that we considered, that's okay, everybody does it. Everybody cheats on their taxes. Everyone tells a little white lie once in a while. Respectable sins. <coughs> For the wages of sin is death. You know, that's really written in a passage that deals with sanctification, how we as Christians live. Even as Christians, our sin's been dealt with, but my sin is what caused Jesus to die on the cross. Even that respectable sin if that's the only thing I'd ever done, put Jesus on the cross. How can I sin? How can I view this with respect? He goes on here and he says, because of a genuine confession, that's why he raised up that, pole, that snake on that pole. He lifted it up because, he says, the people came to Moses and they said, we have sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you, Moses. We sinned. This is confession. It's admitting what they did. They did it wrong. They missed the mark. They had sinned against God and against Moses. Against Moses. They'd sinned against Moses. Against the leader. Some of us need to confess, Lord, I have sinned against you and I've sinned against the president. Because it's not a respectable sin in the eyes of the Lord. I've sinned against you, Lord, and the pastor. I've sinned against you, Lord, and the leadership at the church. Or I've sinned against you, Lord, and the Supreme Court. I, whatever it is that you've sinned against, you've got to confess that. And you've got to genuinely mean it. They genuinely confessed it. And then they did something I don't think that has, that's mentioned anywhere before this in the Bible. They asked Moses to pray for them. Pray for us. I get phone calls, I get text messages, people saying, would you pray for this? And I do. You know, I immediately, as soon as I hang up, I pray for that. Just I'm immediately, I immediately stop where I'm at, and I pray for that. Just like Moses. Moses, Moses, pray that the Lord will take away the snakes. We don't want to be bit anymore. I, I don't want my family dying. I, hey, that's what's going on in this picture, guys, holding this kid. Kid must have got bit by the snake. So Moses prayed for the people. He did. He prays for the people, and God answers. This is why Moses raised up that serpent in, in the desert. The Lord said to Moses, make a snake and put it on the pole. Now, this is the most bizarre remedy to a snake bite I've ever heard of. Make one that looks just like what bit you. Put it up on a pole. He goes on. And so Moses does this, and he says, anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. That's it. You look and live. Look and live. So Moses did exactly what he said. He made a bronze snake and put it on a pole. I want you to notice something in this passage. God did not take away the snakes. The snakes were still there. They wanted the snakes taken away, and God said, I'm not doing it your way. You're not God. I'm God. You never tell me how to do what I'm going to do. I'll tell you what I'm going to do, and you obey me. So he, he, Moses does that. He makes a bronze pole, puts it up, bronze snake, and he puts it on a pole, and he lifts it up. And when anyone that was bitten by the snake looked at the bronze snake, he lived. Just had to look. Can you imagine somebody there saying, Moses, this is the most ridiculous thing. This is not going to work. Been bitten, takes off, heads for his own tent. He says, man, I'm, I'm just feeling terrible. Lays down. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to lay down and sleep this off. He refused to look. That meant he did not live. He did not live. You see, the look here is a look that I look because I believe. I believe what Moses said, what God said, what he did, and, and the means by which God said it would happen. I look with an eye of faith, 
and I believe. I look on that snake on the pole, and by looking, I live. The snake bite is gone. The antidote was just looking at the snake, and I'm no longer infected with the venom of that snake. Now, <clears throat> As we continue in the story, we go back to Jesus. In the John chapter 3, Nicodemus is there, and he's talking to Nicodemus. And he predicts to Nicodemus what's going to happen. He says, just as Moses lifted up that snake in the desert for those so-called respectable sins, he says, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. That's what he must do. He said, I have to do it for a similar reason. As the nation Israel rebelled and, and, and these respectable sins of complaining of impatience and, and not liking the way and the way I was doing things and what I provided, he said, all these little minor things that God sent the snakes and bit them, he's saying, listen, Moses lifted up the, the serpent, so the Son of Man, just like that snake got lifted up on the pole, he's referring to his own crucifixion. I'm being lifted up for sin's sake. I'm going to die on the cross for your sins. We know where it took place. The place is called Calvary. Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. I tried to find a hill that looked like a skull. Can you kind of see it in there? It says, when they had come to the place called Calvary, which also means Golgotha, and translated would mean the hill of the skull, there they crucified him with a criminal on the right hand and one on the other on the left. We know where he did it. And Jesus tells us why. As Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes, he looks with the eye of faith, believes in him, may have eternal life. In the wilderness, they got bit, they looked, they lived. They didn't look, they did not live. In the New Testament, he says, listen, when I'm lifted up on the cross, you look to me, you believe that my death took your place I am the antidote for all your problems I am the antidote for your complaining I'm the antidote for your your rebelling against God I am the antidote for your embezzlement I am the antidote for your drunkenness I am the antidote I am I am it. you look to me you believe in me that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life the text then changes at verse 16 this is the most famous verse in the Bible you know this verse. It was one of our memory verses. For God so loved the world. <clears throat> We're not sure if Jesus is the speaker at this point or Jesus ended the story there at verse 15. I'm inclined to think Jesus ended the story there at verse 15. And in verse 16, John is now commenting on what Jesus said to Nicodemus. And he says, for, let me explain to you if you didn't get it, if you're a little thick, he said, as Moses lifted up the will serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. He said, now if you're a little thick, let me explain what that means. God so loved the world, he applies it to the world. There's an application of God's love here. God loves you so much, so much. He moves it from, he moves it just from the, the nation Israel and he expands it, it's the whole world, it, the world that God loves the world so much that he gave, and this is, a, this is God's grace. God was gracious. You did not deserve this, but God graciously gave you his one and only son, the only begotten son. In Romans chapter 6, 23, but the wages of sin is death. The next part of the verse says, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. That little word in is so important. I got a package up there. It's the box. Jesus is the box. Inside him is eternal life. In order to get the eternal life, you got to take the box. You got to take Jesus. You can't have forgiveness. You can't have forg uh, eternal life. You, you don't get the venom of the snake bite of sin taken away unless you look and believe in his only begotten son, Jesus Christ that whoever believes in him. I got there pointing at you. Years ago at camp, I was camp speaker, and I had junior kids, and I, I made up a box. And in the box, I put some candy bars. And I wrapped the box up, put a ribbon on it, and put a name tag on it, and I said, hey, I've got a gift here for somebody, and there's a name on it. And then I said, it says, uh, who, 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 who's, whoso, whosoever. I said, well, whosoever, come and get it. 
The kids all sat there, hesitated for a moment. Some of them knew what it meant. Others were like, oh, I don't know. I probably hadn't been paying attention anyway. Kids gets up and he starts and then he turns around and goes back because nobody else is moving, thinking he must be wrong. Another kid jumps up because he saw him get up pretty soon. I got three or four of them. Finally, one races up and he, I got it in my hands and I said, are you whosoever? And he said, yeah. I said, well, who is whosoever? He says, it's anybody who will. I said, that, that's right. Will you? He said, yeah. I said, well, so all you got to do is what? He said, take it. So he took it. And I said to everybody, I said, you know, everybody here was a whosoever. But only one person took it. You must appropriate. You must receive it. You must take it. You must make it your own. I can't do that for anyone else. It's there for whoever. Whoever believes in him shall not perish. But when you die, you're taking that escalator up into the sky. You're, gonna, you're, you're going to, the angels of God actually, you're going to be the ones who carry you into the very presence of God. L listen, there's an application here of faith. You must believe. I did this as an eight-year-old boy. I can never tell this story here about First John 3.16. I can't ever go over this verse without telling you my story because it was John 3.16 at Camp Kaskatawa in western Michigan where the preacher used this verse and every place in there he put my name because as I sat by the campfire with him one-on-one, -on -one, he shared that verse. He said, for God so loved Dennis, not world, Dennis because I'm in the world, that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus, on the cross to die for my sins, that whosoever he put my name in there, that if Dennis believes in him, Dennis would not perish, but Dennis would have everlasting life. And I prayed and accepted Jesus as my Savior, August 2nd, 1960. Next day I bought this postcard and I wrote it home to my dear mom. I said, hey mom, Monday I took guns and I got 17 points. Should have put an S on that points. I'll send, oh, should have been two L's on owl. I'll, I'll send a letter pretty soon. I got staved <laughs> yesterday. I got staved. I was never a good speller then. I'm still not a very good speller. I'm a little dyslexic and I was forgetting letters, dropping letters, mixing letters up. That word staved has been erased a couple of times and finally I settled on staved instead of saved. But the truth is Jesus got staved for me. Staved means put on the, a board. He was nailed to the cross. And since I've been crucified with Christ, oh, I got it right. I got staved. Jesus took my sin on the cross. When he was lifted up, I was lifted up because when I believed in Jesus as my Savior, he became my Savior. I am crucified with Christ. I got staved that day. Jesus saved me from my sins because I looked that night to Jesus to be my Savior. I believed in my heart that Jesus died for my sins, he was buried, he rose again, and that he was forgiving me and giving me eternal life. So in light of this, what must I do? What must I do? Mustology, what must I do? You must appropriate it. You must look with the eye of faith and believe in him. I can't do that for you. The message is whosoever, but you've got to do that on your own. You've got to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your own personal Savior from your sins. And then next, you must follow in his steps. I like this verse, 1 John 3.16. 1 John, not John 3.16. 1 John 3.16. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. What Jesus did for me I do for others. Quit complaining. Don't be so impatient. Give up those respectable sins. Live for Jesus by loving your neighbor as yourself. Let's pray. Father in heaven, as we wrap up these musts of the scriptures regarding the life of Jesus and what he said he must do, Lord, there's things we must do. We must believe in Jesus. Look to him to live. Perhaps there's someone here right now who's never done that and they're saying, I need to look with the eye of faith to Jesus so I can live. And so right now, Lord, I, I'm asking that they would pray and say, Lord, I need you. I've been bitten by sin. 
The venom is taking me down. I know the antidote is Jesus, who was lifted up on the cross and paid for my sins. He was buried and he rose again the third day, showing he actually took away my sin. I believe in him as my Savior and Lord with all of my heart. Save me, O Lord. Well, Father, I know if anyone prays something, anything close to that means it in their heart, you'll save them today. And Father, for us who are followers of Jesus, we pray that we would follow in the steps of Jesus. And we'd say, I must, I must follow in the steps of Jesus. Even if it means giving my life for my friends, my brothers and sisters in Christ. I will not live for myself. I will live for you and for those who you love, Lord. Help me do that today. In Jesus' name, amen.